Good morning, my friends. Hello. Good morning. Please take your seats. Hey guys, if you're tuning in and listening to this class online, I'm just going to give the in-person students a sec to sit down and stop talking. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> stop talking. Most of the videos that I post for you guys are not going to be the recorded lectures, but some of them will, and we'll get better. We'll get better at this. We won't take up too much of your time. I do apologize in advance. Um, if anyone asks a question, I will, and I address it in class, of course, I will be sure to tell you what they asked. And that way, if they have questions, they can help you too. All right. Now, everybody, online students and everybody in this room, please get your sketchbooks out if you don't have them out already. And yes, uh, and your sketchbook. And f flip to a clean page or a clean section of pages. And just don't just don't write on something that you've already done as far as artwork and just do a clean a clean section or a clean page for your notes for today's class. All right. Okay. Uh, some house cleaning before we get started on unity and variety. Um, I want to go over some sketchbook stuff with y'all because I've got I had some great questions over the weekend about. Uh, sketchbook organization. So first I would like to say that today we're going to cover unity and variety, which are principles of design, which we haven't really talked about, but we will continue to talk about the principles and the elements um, as the semester goes on. So expect to um, expect to continue these types of notes. Like this is an umbrella topic. Principles of design is an, um, is an umbrella topic, so there will be more that you have to add. With that in mind, how how should you organize your sketchbook? The moral of the story is, I don't really, I don't, I, I won't take points if your sketchbook isn't organized page by page. Um, a lot of students, number one, do organization in chronological order, and what that means is you take notes, you know, you write your notes out, and then on the next page you do your sketchbook assignment that's related, and then you do the project that might be related to the unit that we talk about. And then just so on. So the sketchbook pages follow the order that our syllabus does. Um, the second thing I see is um, students might have a section of pages reserved for notes and then a section reserved for sketchbook assignments and then a final section that has all their big projects like maybe 10, page are, 10 pages at the front of the sketchbook are left blank and then they just fill it in with notes as they wish. Um, you know... The, the sketchbook, it really is for you. This benefits you. And I will be able to flip through at the end of this. If you, if you turn into a physical copy to me, if you're in person, when I um, when you turn it in at the end of the semester, I'll be able to flip through and check off which notes I see, which sketchbook projects are complete, and, of course, which big projects are complete. So we will talk in person Students, we will talk about the organization and anything, any edits you might need to make and how to organize it later. But for now, just use it. You know, this is a, an exploration uh, journal, if you will. It's a diary, if you will. It, it, even if there are pages that you don't want me to see, I'll tell you guys how to submit to me, uh, how to submit sketchbooks to me so that I don't look at certain pages. I actually had to do that in undergrad, too, because we all know. There are some personal things that you have to like visually get out of your system. That's fine. Um, if you are online students, as far as sketchbooks are concerned, y'all will turn in a digital portfolio to me. So it really doesn't matter how you organize your sketchbook because you're going to submit um, image files or scans to me. So how am I supposed to know how you organize your sketchbook? As long as it's legible and um, like I can read stuff and I can see stuff clearly on your scans and your images that'll be it'll be fine don't worry about organization you just use it however you want to but make sure you do all of the site the assignments uh online kiddos um i will send you guys a kind of like a cheat sheet of expectations 
and I also have these examples over here on this um, bookshelf. Feel free to look through them at any time. Previous students have left theirs here or said, hey, yeah, you can use this sketchbook as examples, whatever. Um, look at them on your free time, and we'll also go over them in lab so that I can show you guys how to like properly adhere sketchbook pages. All right, house cleaning is done. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Had to get that out, but I hope it is beneficial to you guys. Um, use it in a way that benefits you. Okay. All right. Now, since you're on a clean, fresh piece or section of your sketchbook, this is probably the first thing I want you. No, not probably. This is the first thing I want you to write down. Uh, you can also take a picture of this, if, in case you know, you know, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, so you can just write it down. But yeah, feel free to take a picture of it. Keep it in your phone if you're um, on the go trying to work or something and you need to remember these vocabulary things. Uh, these are the elements and principles of design. Again, we haven't gone over all of these yet, but we will. Make sure to leave space to write them. Trust the process. You're going to learn as you go. In the meantime, I will post some short videos on D2L so you can cover these items ahead if you wish, but we will go in depth uh, uh, further down the line. So the elements and principles. Uh, elements on the left, point, line, shape, texture, value, and color. Principles, unity, variety, we'll talk about those today. Balance, scale, proportion, rhythm, and emphasis. What the heck are these things? I've heard them explained a couple of ways. Um, and I also should know, should let you know that when it comes to the visual arts, there are many people who uh, have different elements and different principles. Like, so for the, the fine arts, point is not necessarily an element of fine art, like painting, drawing, sculpture. Um, also, form is in there, as in the three-dimensional uh, partner of shape. So, um, but you know, the elements of fine art include 3D stuff like sculpture too. Uh, movement and time are also in there. Um, I'm trying to think of other things on the top of my head. The lists are not definite. There's no, there's no like perfect list of elements of art. But when we're talking about um, 2D design, remember that we're focusing on the two dimensional. So um, in design, you know, you know that there's um, three-dimensional uh, proponents of design, as in 3D modeling and, um, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, one, of, one of the students just mentioned that motion and time could be in 2D design if it's a cartoon or the illusion of uh, a movie or something. That's true. Yes, exactly. So when you're working at Pixar and you're you're working on design for, uh, let's say, what's a good Pixar movie, you guys? Toy Story 17. <laughs> when you're working on the movie Toy Story 17 and you're working in your 3D modeling software, you will always consider, even, even if it's, you know, subconsciously or involuntarily, you will always consider the elements of, of art and in design in a 3D three-dimensional sense because you're trying to create the illusion of three dimensions even though it'll be displayed on two dimensions okay anyway I'm sorry tangent I'm so excited for Toy Story 17 um <laughs> okay yes so here's an analogy that I love to use I like sports and I apologize if you're not a sports person but please try and bear with me try and see if you can um, add this if you can imagine what I'm trying to say each element, those on the left, is a position player. They all excel at different things in practice. They're fast, they're strong, they can hit shots really accurately. But when we group them together in a game, they can be a force for destruction. <laughs> they can be really good, right? So just like the value scale that you guys did in your sketchbook, the first sketchbook exercise, you used line, which is a position player, and sometimes point, so if you used uh, stippling or dots, you used both of those players to create value or a, a, a light to dark. Mm -hmm. So you created an optical illusion using three separate elements. Awesome. 
right? Okay, so when when the elements of design and art, when they're used separately, they can convey a message. They can cause meaning, they can cause visual understanding, but when they're used together, man, they, they are really powerful. Um, the principles then, on the right side, um, they're, I would say they're more like plays or strategies or goals of your team. So you're the manager of this team. As the designer, as the artist, as the creative, you're the manager. You choose which players to put in and which ones to sub. You choose the strategies um, per design assignment or prompt. You choose the strategies that will help you win. Yeah. So your, your strategies or your plays or your principles, these are your why. This is your intention as a designer. So keep keep all these analogy, <laughs> yeah. Keep this analogy in mind uh, when you when when we look at designs. Yeah, yay sports, go team. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's practice then. Um, let's talk about unity first. Unity, as you can probably imagine, is found when the visual elements imply a type of oneness or togetherness, cohesion, likeness. Exactly. Yep. And here's here's an example on the right. This is a painting. It is made with airbrush, an airbrush, an acrylic paint. Um Yeah, take it in. Uh the artist is Mark Reedy. R I E D Y. Mark Reedy. Mm -hmm. Right? Doesn't it look like a like a graphic design poster or or something? Or illustration or something? Yeah. That's great. Uh, um let's see. A day at the beach 19 I think it was the 1960 no, 1980s I think. I'm not a, an expert on Mark Reedy. <laughs> Sorry guys. I guess I can provide that information for you. I will. Um Okay, so here in this painting We'll talk about three, there are more than three, but we'll talk about three strategies that unify this painting. So one, one strategy or one play that Mark Reedy uses is that the major shapes are organized diagonally. Okay, so see how all the shapes pretty much slice the composition from like bottom left to top right. Mm -hmm. So the lines in the sand on the bottom, the lines in the sanding, sand are going uh, parallel, bottom left to top right. Um, the changes in the water colors and the little swirlies are also doing the same thing. Bottom left to top right. Mm -hmm. And that the, the water and the shifts from sand to water really emphasize that. It really breaks up the composition there. So speaking of that break, though, that's a very powerful break, right? There's a very dark value on the top relatively and a very light value on the bottom relatively, as in compared to what we see in this particular work alone. So number two then, another strategy, the second strategy is that this painting is split into thirds. The top third is water and the bottom two thirds are filled with stand. And this, this split is a little bit abstract. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you can look it up. That's fine. Yeah, uh, guys, if, if you want to look up um, this, this I do this all the time in my classes. If you want to look up your this painting on your phone and like zoom in and zoom around, that's that's absolutely doable. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, just just make sure it doesn't distract you. I trust you. <laughs> it's OK. Uh huh. OK. Yes. Um, so back to the painting, it's split into thirds. The top third is water and the bottom thirds, or, yeah, the bottom two thirds are filled with sand. This, this concept here is a little bit abstract and I won't go too much into specifics, but have you guys heard of the golden ratio, the golden mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you heard of the rule of thirds too? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know a lot of you guys here, especially, have taken photography. So um, if you have a phone, <laughs> a smartphone, and you, like, maybe the first time you get it and you take pictures, you open your camera and you take pictures, you might have that little grid on your screen, and it has two uh, horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Mm -hmm. Well, essentially, that is breaking your screen up into thirds so that you can properly, or, or not properly, so that you can... Uh, how do you say this? Effectively. So you can effectively take pictures that already have good composition. The same rule applies here. So this is um, all derived from the golden ratio formula, which is a mathematical formula, and it is um, psychologically, visually pleasing, I guess. Um, and this, this has worked for a really long time. This um, golden ratio or the golden mean spans all the way back to Euclid, so like classical antiquity. This is very historically widely understood. Rule of thirds is good for composition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, it's the, if you look it up online, you guys, it's that uh, seashell looking line. And, and online you can see works of art that were uh, like successful or photographs that were successful that have an overlay of that golden ratio spiral. Mm -hmm. All right, number three, the third strategy that is very clear here is that there are 19 repeated umbrella shapes in this composition. The things that we understand are umbrellas. I'm sure we can gather why repetition tends to increase the sense of unity, right? Yeah. All right, and so here's a little bit of uh, compositional analysis. Um, you can see the thought process here the division of the painting into thirds, the strong diagonal lines, and the emphasis on the umbrellas. Yep, this is just um, this is just an overlay on top of the image, uh, and the designer here just highlighted the strategy. Like this is a playbook, right? It looks like a playbook, something you draw on a whiteboard. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I know, not really, but okay. So these are the bones of the building blocks, I guess, the bones of the painting, the spine of the painting, the things that makes it um, work, makes all the elements work well. Um, this is something that architects like to do for design thinking. I did this a ton in architecture school, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but it is a tool that is widely, widely used. And so what they'll do is they will take uh, an image of an, aer an aerial image, like a Google Maps image, let's say, of a site where they plan to put their structure and they will print it out real big and they'll put a piece of uh, tracing paper or butter paper, which is just yellow tracing paper. It's just a field term. Um, and they'll put that tracing paper over the picture, over the image, and they will explore that image to find any site unity. And the reason I don't agree with this necessarily is because this is what this exercise is an aerial understanding of space and an aerial understanding of, of context or site. And uh, it's not necessarily the way that humans understand a site. You know, like when you're driving along, it, we, we kind of get it because we use Google Maps, you know, like we we have an aerial, a consistent aerial view of something every single day. And it helps us understand proximity, but it doesn't necessarily zoom in and help us understand the way that we emotionally respond or physically respond to a site, like a park. When you go to the park, I don't imagine that when you're there, you think about, you know, where you are aerially, unless I guess you're lost or something and you need a map. But when you go to, um, let's see, if you go to a, natu a national park and you go to look at the mountains, when you look at the mountains, you look outward right? You look panoramically. You look, your your grounding point is the horizon line. You know where you are basic, based on the horizon line. You know you're standing right side up. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a huge tangent. Please forgive me. But um, site analysis usually starts like this. So if I know you're a future architect. You're a future architect. So you guys bring this little nugget of former architecture student with you <laughs> learn learn the rules of this exercise but don't necessarily hold them to heart okay 
Okay. So I know that I just kind of um, ripped apart this type of uh, design in architecture, but <laughs> I actually do find beauty in it. Here's an example. This is quite beautiful. Um, if you appreciate um, order and design thinking visually and lines and connecting shapes, if you appreciate that this type of geometrical um, synergy is a good word, um, if you appreciate this type of stuff, then you might appreciate the sketchbooks of architects or um, interior designers and industrial designers. You can see their thinking on paper. Well, um, yeah, so to me, to me, these types of analyses, these aerial and design analyses are quite lovely on their own as like standalone works of art. That's what I do. Uh, or that's that's a method that I use in my paintings. Um, I utilize a lot of architecture study and the methods and the theories in my my works of art. Yeah, because they're great. They're, they're design thinking. OK, so um, here is an example of one of these design analyses taking place. You don't need to know how to do this or anything. You don't have to struggle with the notes on this. It's just an example. Just trying to give some people some context of how to use this later. Um, OK, so you can see uh, you can see the thick black silhouettes of buildings on the left. Um, these were taken into account for the design of whatever structure was planned here but the analysis and solution are more clearly visible in the right image, the big image that's taking up. Wow, look at that, two thirds of the right of the screen. Wow, look at us, look at us designers. Good job, you noticed that, good job. <laughs> All right, so on the big right, the larger right image, um, do, 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 do. notice the blue lines that run through the composition, the blue and the black. Um, they run through the center of that, looks like a cruciform type structure on the left. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're still on the right image though. Yeah. So right under that paragraph of words, you can see the little grid structure with the circle in the middle. Yeah, that, yes, exactly. That's the, uh -huh. that's the intersection I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, okay. So the bottom line, the bottom blue line, that runs kind of that kind of cuts the composition in half. That line is a line that was made by the designer. So everything underneath it is basically existing. It already exists in the space. And the architect or the designer laid that blue line down to help them to remember, hey, this is a sight line. This is a, a, a level of continuity or sameness or likeness. These are the things that I've noticed. This is a pattern that I've noticed in this site. And everything basically is built off of those blue lines. Mm hmm Yep. And notice on the red blocks, the reddish, orangish buildings, the roofs of those buildings, um, those are laid out in relation to those existing axes. Mm hmm Yes. And so to bring this all home, I'm sorry, I definitely got on a tangent, but I, to bring this all home... Um, Design analysis is used to uncover unity. So the architect here found unity in the site, laid down those blue lines, and to continue unity of the site, at least in this aerial perspective, at least in this bird's eye view, to, to continue that unity, they have laid out buildings that um, conform to the existing patterns of the site that's already there. Does that make sense? Okay, I know I can't get a response from online folks, but if it doesn't make sense, please email me and just reference, you know, a um, slide that has a aerial analysis or kind of 2D analysis. I will help you, I promise. I'm sorry, I know I'm a nerd, but I love it. Okay, you guys got it? And we're back. Okay, um, so here's a better view of the painting, Mark Reedy. Oh yeah, it is right there, 1988, on the bottom right. There it is. Okay. Oh, sorry guys. Hang on one sec. All right. So, um, what are some things in this painting that don't follow the theme of likeness? That don't unify. What are some things that are not unifying about this uh, composition? 
Mm-hmm. Yep, that red umbrella right smack dab in the center. This is not like the others. What's that saying? Something is not like the others? I can't remember. <laughs> Too much caffeine. Uh, anything else? Yep, that little triangle. I think that's a sailboat. Um, yeah, I think it's a sailboat right at the edge of the water. I think that's the sail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you think these are not unifying? What about them is different? Yeah, easy, right? The color. Uh-huh. The color. So, um, take a second to... I am so sorry, my phone, you guys. Um, take a second and think about what impacted you how this how how these differences impacted you as a viewer mm -hmm. yep so as a personal journey um i noticed after after i noticed the umbrella my eye was drawn to similar warm and darker values so those similar things are the people the little humans um and it, it made me want to get closer and see what they were up to maybe why this umbrella was unique and why it held any significance it made me think it made me engage with this composition yes and so this this is um remember the principles are attached to the designers why these are decisions these, yes these are actual decisions even in uh artworks that are abstract and don't you can't recognize any subjects these are decisions that designers make mm -hmm. yep so if you go back to the list of elements and principles that you wrote down, um, why, oh, this is going to be like a really simple answer, but kind of abstract. Um, why, why does that umbrella stand out to you? Yeah, one of these things is not like the others. That's a saying. Yes, I knew it would come to me. Um, it creates a level of contrast. Exactly. So just like when we talked about value, um, darkness and lightness, dark to light. If you have a very, very dark area in a drawing or in a photograph, and then you put a super, super light value right next to it, your eye immediately goes toward it because you can see like, oh, there's a really intense difference in value there. This is a subconscious thing, but your eye is drawn to that variety. Your eye is drawn to that sudden shift, the sudden flash of change, yes. So this red umbrella, maybe it's not super, super dark in value, but this sudden flash of red is what drew us. So if you guys are catching on, our eye, our human eye and our brain craves variety. Whether we know it or not, it does. It craves variety. This is maybe part of the reason why we dress differently, why our favorite colors are different, why we want to put super shiny stickers on our car because we want to stand out. Um, this is derivative of our desire for variety. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't want to, you know, our clothes to match and we don't like a monochrome palette and we don't want, um, you know, like our, our color, like our skin color looks really great in the color green or something. We do need some sameness and we do need some routine in our life, but variety as far as visuals are concerned is very striking and is proven to draw attention. So keep that in mind. Hem <laughs> graphic designers. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, yes, settle down, folks. <laughs> it's always the graphic designers. You guys are like the percussion of band. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm a graphic designer, too. Okay. All right, so this, my friends, uh, I apologize. I got ahead of myself last slide. This is the success of variety. Mm -hmm. That red umbrella and that sailboat there, yep, that's the success of variety. That's another principle, another play. Uh-huh. If you want to write a definition for variety, I'm sorry, I didn't give it to you first. Um, write something like, variety is the difference that a, uh, let's see, the different the differences, the many differences or a difference that gives a design its visual and compositional interest. The differences that give a design a visual and a compositional interest. You can pause this if you're watching it online rewind to variety is the differences are is, is a, uh, a group of differences that give 
a design, visual, and compositional interests. Mm -hmm. Yep, and just to quickly review, the visual interest here is achieved through contrast of color, that red on white, uh, emphasis, yep, mm -hmm. and emphasis is achieved right to that spot. Mm -hmm. um, so emphasis is another principle that, uh, emphasis and focal point are principles that artists use, fine artists use, that aren't necessarily included in 2D design because it's kind of given, you know, emphasis is given here. It's, it's just widely understood, so there's not necessarily a need to separate it here. Eh, tangent. Again. Okay. Yep. The differences. Variety is the differences. Compositional differences. Visual differences that provide visual and compositional interest. Mm -hmm. don't, write, don't write a circular definition, <laughs> I guess. Uh, just make sure you have visual interest and in, uh, composition in there. All right. So uh, bring it on back, y'all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when our players, when our position players are used together, they can be quite effective, as you know. But we all know that each of them has a ball hog. Uh -huh. Each team has a ball hog that can sway the outcome one way or the other. Don't raise your hand. Uh-uh. <laughs> Oh, look at him. He's hiding because he feels seen. You feel seen? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, look. The ball hog doesn't mean we always lose. Come on. You guys know this. Yeah, the ball hog's the best player, right? Don't tell them. Don't tell them that. <laughs> All right. So here, here are some uh, examples of the extremes. These are the 2D design ball hogs. All right, the, graph, the graphite drawing on the left is quite unified. Yeah, it is it has tons of unity, right? It is only unity, basically. I yeah, know it's not. But um, yeah, it's very unified. It has one subject and one color palette. Uh huh. I think it, it might work, you know, if the, if the drawing were done with colored pencil as opposed to graphite. Yeah, pencil. This is a pencil drawing. Mm -hmm. It's not a photograph. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, the skill, the dedication, right? You can appreciate this work of art. Woo. Uh-huh. Okay, so um, it's unified, right? Why? I just told you. Yep, it has one subject, water. It's at one angle. Um, the only, I mean, it's rhythmic. You could tell that the, the pattern here is choppy water. You can almost detect the motion that's going on here. Um, the only variation, I guess, in this drawing is perhaps the height of each wave um the value scale it's quite dark relatively on the bottom kind of neutral in the on the top and through the middle right but this drawing implies solace quietness deep thinking but too much unity can come across as monotonous mm -hmm. same same not very interesting Just wait till the end, though. I do appreciate this drawing. I do. I don't, I'm not hating on it. Just wait till the end. Trust me. All right. Now, the collage on the right, this is one that you guys can look up um, and zoom in if you want to, because I know there's a lot of information there. The collage is a fun, it's a digital collage, actually. actually. Uh, it's fun, right? Um, this is a work by Michael Waraska, W-A-R-A-K-S-A. -A -A. Oops. So, Waraksa. Uh -huh. And this is the embodiment of variety, right? The subject has six arms. I would say that's quite um, varying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the you can you can look in closer to see if there are any um, patterns, rhythms, themes, any organization here. Mm -hmm. But but variety is basically the dominant principle in this composition, right? So we have unity on the left, variety on the right. Who wins? Eh, trick question. <laughs> yeah, everybody wins. Let's be real. Let's be positive. Okay, these are examples of the extremes. 
unity and variety, but, 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 they are not failures. And they're not even bad. Like these designs, these works of art are not bad. These compositions are not bad. They're great, actually. They're quite successful. Um, each of these artists had separate intentions for their works of art at, that embody a heavy sense of, you know, monotony, I guess, or chaos in each. So what this means is there is not always a universal solution. Write that down. <laughs> There's not always a formulaic thing. There's not always a formula that you can follow to make something, a design, work. You will go through a process of visually figuring this out. Your first idea is rarely your best idea. I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Each design project calls for you for different strategies, different plays, maybe even different starters, you know, like when I don't want to use specific sports analogies, but when a certain play, a team plays a, a ranked team, they might start differently. They might have different starters than a, the team who plays, you know, the worst team in the league. Right. So these the, these are strategies. Mm hmm. I'm so sorry for the sports analogies, you guys. <laughs> Go team! Go team. My, my mom, oh my gosh, my mom just, um, we went to Austin a couple weeks ago, and or maybe it was last weekend, and we went to this like indoor garage sale, and they had some really great things there. Everything was basically, yeah, I think it was new. All that stuff was new, but um, she found, she came up to me, we had separated, and then she came up to me later and had a bag of something that she had bought for me, and she goes, oh my gosh, I got us the cutest things and she pulled out two sweatshirts, two matching sweatshirts that just say football on them, like, like in team, team typography letters. And I was like, mom, these are so cute. I love matching. I do. I actually love my mom. We're friends. Um, but we're going to wear them to the Super Bowl party because we don't necessarily care about any of the teams that are playing. Yeah. We're here for the snacks basically. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, <laughs> That's so cute. Okay, sorry. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, we're about halfway done. Okay, this is uh, pretty abstract, so just try and stay with me here. If you don't understand it, that's okay. Uh, you're not required to take notes on this gestalt or gestalt principle, but I do want to go over it with you, especially for um, graphic designers. Please try and understand this. Um, this is just a basic overview. It's a very old theory and... Uh, I guess, perspective, but it will help you if you can get your mind wrapped around it. So um, I'll recommend some books for you guys later if you if you really want to dig into it. So um, from a psychological perspective, it has been understood that humans crave visual variety, just like I said, not the chaotic kind of variety like that digital collage, but humans will interpret something holistically, as in they'll look at its unity first before examining its separate parts. This is called the Gestalt Principle. So again, the Gestalt Principle is a psychological perspective. It's a theory. And it basically states that humans will interpret something holistically or as a whole, they will evaluate the entire thing and then they will examine its separate parts. So you'll basically it's a uh, uh, the modern usage, I guess, is you would zoom into something. The process of zooming in. You start out wide, you zoom in. You take it all in, you focus. This is the Gestalt principle. Um, this is pretty complex, like I said, but we can look at a few essential parts of the uh, Gestalt principle that create unifying forces. So actually, yeah, go ahead and make a little subtitle for the Gestalt principle Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at, I think I have four in here, but I think there are six. So we're going to look at four, four principles that uh, create a really strong sense of unity. Mm -hmm. So this can go under you, your unity section. Okay, the first one is called grouping. So let's practice. Um, in our attempts to unify, psychologically, we will group units that we see by um, orientation, shape, color, location. So where they where, where they are um, located in a composition. Um, tell me about the grouping that you see in A. 
the, the leftmost box. How, okay, how many groups are there? Two, yes. How do you know? How do you know that there are two groups there? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because of because of where they are, they they are like visual vis, bleh, visibly separated, a top group and a bottom group, uh, and the color. One is a really really dark value group, and one is a neutral or a lighter value group, black and gray. Mm -hmm. So remember the Gestalt principle. Um, let's see, the, the first the first way that we evaluate things is that we group them. Number one is that we group them. Um, we can group them in many ways, but four prominent ways that we do group them, proven, is by location, so top and bottom, as in group A, orientation, which is like the way, the direction, you know, um, the shape of items, and the color of items. So um, remember, this is unity, so this is the way that we interpret unity psychologically, and we put like with like. We organize stuff. Okay, so now that you have those those things in mind, how is how is group B unified? Yes, exactly. Awesome. Everything is angled the same way. Its orientation is diagonal, right? So all of these little objects are di I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Too. I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even have that in my notes or anything. The shapes are also relatively long. Mm-hmm. They are elongated compositions. Yep. Yep. All right. Okay. And yeah, they're all the same color, so they'll they'll just be. Um. Okay. And C. This one's a little bit tough. This always has. Yeah. This always has different answers. Okay, I promise it's not a trick question. I don't want you guys to be wrong. I won't give you trick questions. Okay, um, so there's definitely, I'll just, I'll just explain it to you. We're kind of running out of time, I'm sorry. Um, there's definitely a unifying size of things. So all of the shapes, all the forms here are relatively the same size. Like there's not, the squares are not hugely bigger in proportion to the other things. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that we group things, um, or it's a unifying principle, I guess. Um, let's see, do, 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 maybe two or three groups can be identified based on color. So this, to me, the triangles and the circles all have a very similar value. They're, they're three separate values, but the gray of the triangle, the triangles and the gray of the circles are very similar. So my eye, to my eye, there are two groups, but I know to a lot of people who have better eyesight than me, there can be three groups, the squares, the triangles, and the circles just based on value. But, like I, like I basically just said, the squares, the triangles, and uh, the circles are also groupings. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the most prominent group to me are those dark squares. And notice how everything, um, every group is oriented the same way. So the, the squares are all uh, parallel, they're at like a 90 degree orientation. The triangles are more 45, and we don't know about the circles unless you're a magic wizard. But um, if, let's just say, for example, if those triangles were kind of twisted or rotated separate ways, so if they all didn't face the same direction, that would be something that causes disharmony or, or uh, I don't want to say disunity, but it kind of takes away from, it would take away from the unity. Just kind of imagine that. Draw it if you want, you know, draw these things. Yes. Oh, do you feel like you're in kindergarten again? Yeah. <laughs> Circles, triangles, squares, squiggly lines. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can take pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll say this, guys. If you are definitely a visual, I mean, I, I know a lot of people. Everybody. We'll just say everybody who has sight is a visual learner. Mhm. Mm some people are more skilled at it than others, and some people cherish it more than others, but. Um, in my personal experience, I'm a creative person. I must use my hands. Um, there are things about me that require me to do things manually in order to get them. Mm -hmm. Just just draw it. It doesn't have to be beautiful. You know, I, of course, you remember I'm not grading you on your drawing accuracy. But if it helps you remember, which you probably will, go for it. All right. 
another force. Sorry guys, I bumped the microphone. I'm so sorry. Hope it didn't cause any loud noises to come. Um, all right. Another force of unity uh, through the Gestalt principle, another evaluation that we do, something that helps is called containment. We will notice containment. Um, a container of any kind helps to unify subjects or composition. This is why we put our socks in a drawer to contain them, <laughs> to unify them so that we know where they are, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, containers encourage us to seek the connections among visual units or subjects. And it also adds definition to the negative space. Or if you're a graphic designer, you'll call it white space. Mm -hmm. Yep, and just, just a, a reminder, I don't actually know if I've gone over this with you guys yet, but um, when when there are, are shapes in a composition, especially ones that are well-defined well and crisp like these shapes are, um, we would consider shapes, especially the, these darker value ones in these examples, we would consider those positive space or positive shapes. And the negative space is everything that's around them. So in A, in all, all the jumbled mess of A, the negative space or the white space, um, if you're using graphic design terms, is the entire white background. Yep, so this little uh, swoosh on the bottom right doesn't count as negative space. In fact, it's, it's actually kind of like a medium space or a positive shape. Um, but if you uh, contain something, like in B, C, and D, the negative space is everything that is uh, the background that you interpret or that you understand as background. So the white space that's within the rectangle or square. And then the positive shapes or the positive space is everything that's outlined. Yep. And so here's a real world example. We have gone back to the phone, the phone camera, the smartphone. Um, the, this type of containment, this idea of containment is, uh, you probably have used this before. It's like taking a picture of the same subject from multiple angles. I know all you famous social media influencers in here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, you've practiced this, the relationship of the subjects with the edges of the phone screen are very, very important. Um, the other items in the picture can change the meaning and the compositional successes of each thing. So um, here's an example. The left image is center weight and the right image is bottom weight. This is a typical principle when it comes to photographing human subjects. Um, human subjects are taller than they are wide. So having them near the bottom gives them, and because they're humans, it's not like you're taking a picture of a fire, a fire hydrant or anything, but since they are connected to the ground, since they're humans, they have a tendency to appear heavy. And so putting them toward the bottom edge or even the bottom corner, one of the corners, is uh, successful in making a picture visually, a photograph, sorry, making a, a composition or a photograph visually interesting, but it also pays respect to the background. So the image on the left is a family or friends, I guess, whoever, a group of people in a, an outdoor setting. But since they're in the center, you, you feel a sense of the gross grounds, like the muddy, wet, soft, gross ground that they're standing on, right? But in the, in the rightmost picture, you get, you, you have appreciate, sorry, I'm so sorry. You have an appreciation for the greenery you know, their, their context, where they are. Mm -hmm. You understand them more in the context. Uh, yes, whether it's a jungle or whatever that is. An adventure. Mm -hmm. Yep, so if, you're, if you uh, take graduation photos or, you know, or something, if you ask someone to take a picture of you and your family, um... Just ask them, you know, show them an example of what you'd like. Say, hey, can you take a picture of us and um, kind of keep our feet close to the bottom? Eh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. 
sorry, <laughs> if you are the person taking a picture of someone else, just do them a favor. They will thank you. Just no, they won't thank you because they won't even subconsciously understand how skilled you are. Just do it. Put them closer to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gestalt principle number three. Every <laughs> number three. Every time I I I say or hear number three, I cannot unsee or unhear. You know that Guardians of the Galaxy, the Marvel movie. Yeah. Okay. You guys know. There's a scene where they're in the prison and Rocket is trying to like remove the gravity or like they've all escaped and they, they, they go into this escape pod or something. And the prison guard is telling his soldiers to like shoot the glass of the escape pod. And he's like, fire on my command. And when he says number three, <laughs> like, like fire number three, he spits a little like I don't know I just can't unsee it and I can't unhear it so number three <laughs> repetition okay I'm sorry I'm showing my age I guess um all right so this one is perhaps the easiest as you can imagine repetition becomes unifying quite quickly especially when you use uh, or when it is used as the primary compositional strategy this is a photoshopped image by Elaine Cornu C-O-R-N-U. Uh, this is called Repetition Camera. That's the title of this piece. And you can see the obvious unifying element here. The camera itself, or the cameras themselves, are repeated, and their orientations and shadows further that unifying and repetitive process. So like even the shadows, they're subtle, but even the shadows create a type of repetitive pattern. They're all facing the same way. The um, appendages that are stuck to the wall create repetition also. Mm -hmm. So what's your response to this image, guys? Yeah, it's pretty powerful, huh? Especially to us. If someone were looking at this maybe in the 1800s, they'd be like, what is this wizardry? You know, what is that? Um, but we're, we're very used to seeing cameras around and... Yeah, it's a little ominous. Ooh, that's a good word. Mm -hmm, ominous. Uh, this one was this one was actually done, uh, I guess, relatively recently, 2016. So it's contemporary. I mean, it's done with Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Digital editing. Yep. Okay, here's the last one, you guys. The last Gestalt principle is continuity. We have seen this word before in our lectures uh, in the line lecture. Remember when we talked about the AT&T logo? Uh-huh. It refers to a degree of connection. Mm -hmm. This is about connection. Uh, the connection between compositional parts. So just like line, how we talked about line embodying continuity, the connections can be actual connections or they want, they can be implied. So similar here, you can achieve continuity through actual connections, like vis like provable connections or implied ones, the ones that make um, our brain in, uh, understand it. And again, continuity helps create a sense of movement through the composition. This one's a little bit more ab abstract too. So this, painting that you see before you is unified. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, this painting is unified because of the way that our eye moves and revolves around. Mm -hmm. um, this is a painting by Frank Stella and he utilizes line and shape and sometimes color to guide the viewer's eye in circles. Mm -hmm. Your eye follows the light outlined curves and implies a sense of continuity through the weaving bands of color, even though they break in certain places. So like this magenta uh, burgundy band on the left side, it's broken in the middle. You see that it's split by two other overlapping circles, but um, you, you still understand in your brain, your brain just kind of like fills in that shape and it, it understands that those two are connected. Yep. 
So just to bring that all together, the movement of the eye around this painting is predictable and it's repetitive, hence it is unifying. Mm hmm Fantastic. Okay. Yep. So um, let's um, let's bring it all let's bring it all back together in review. Uh, unity and variety are under what umbrella of two principles? Exactly. These are uh, two basic principles of design, and honestly, unity and variety are the probably most powerful and uh, basic building blocks of 2D design. Yes. Since we are designing in 2D, since we are trying to create illusions of understanding in 2D, unity and variety are the things that help viewers understand uh, emphasis and importance, hierarchy, all of those things are achieved through unity and variety. Now remember, you don't have to have both. You can have uh, a more dominant sense of unity if you're trying to uh, create, you know, a unifying or, or <laughs> sorry, um, if you're trying to create a, a sense of cohesion or sameness or uh, even minimalism, yep, you can have unity there. Um, the same type of uh, cohesion can be achieved with variety. So like Apple, com Apple, Apple commercials, right? Um, if you see Apple commercials on TV or even sometimes on YouTube, a lot of times brand identity will trigger your memory. So the background will be like white or black, um, a single color, and then a simple tiny little apple, their logo will appear in the middle. And the, the logo is usually like gray or silver, which helps trigger your memory of the, the um, aluminum material that most of their products are made with. Yeah. But uh, if the background is white and the apple is gray, like a light steel gray, it's not necessarily that contrasting. But the fact that there is so much unity with the whiteness of the background and so much um, emphasis implied with a single central logo. Yeah, exactly. It's cohesive with their brand. So I know a lot of this is uh, complex and it can be applied in different ways through different in different fields and things that's fine but um mm -hmm. so so don't maybe don't think about it too hard for your sketchbook assignments uh oh speaking of that online students your sketchbook assignment uh for this for unity and variety will be in a separate video or a separate presentation so um go ahead uh, look for that in d2l Yes, but when you're when you're working on these in your sketchbook, just focus on uh, using your players, your unity and uh, sorry, using your your players, your elements to achieve unity and variety or variety and why. You know, if it helps you, just get a piece of paper after you're done. Get a piece of uh, uh, tracing paper um, or tissue paper if you're delicate enough with you know drawing. Um, you can overlay it in your sketchbook or you can even take a picture of it with your phone or your uh, iPad or your whatever drawing software you use and you can um, find plumb lines or um, sight lines like we talked about. You can do a digital analysis of your own work that actually does work really well for graphic designers. Um, you, it's like checking your work in math. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, I'm going to end this presentation. You guys in class, don't get up, but you will, you're going to take a break in a second. Um, online students, thank you for your attention. I know this lecture was a bit longer than the others. Uh, and next time, uh, just, just, I guess, look for the next presentation in D2L. Please email me if you can't access any of them, because I know we have some issues with corruption and uh, like videos getting messed up and choppy. From transferring and stuff so um, you guys are free to take a break online students thank you for your attention again y'all have a great day and I'll, I'll talk to y'all next time <laughs>